seeking happiness for the people. That's part of the title of Beijing's white paper on human rights. It lays out the Chinese thinking about the primary and basic human rights, subsistence and development. The government says people's rights have been improved since 1949 when New China was founded, and especially after 2012 when a key meeting of the Communist Party of China was held. An array of achievements, among them the right to food, the elimination of absolute poverty, improved living standards, safe drinking water, improved housing conditions, more convenient public transport, and better public health. Notably, nearly 760 million people have been lifted out of poverty since China introduced its opening up policy in late 1978. And life expectancy has increased from 35 years at the founding of the new China to 77 in 2018. Well, I've traveled to many countries all over the world, but what has impressed me with China is their absolute dedication to ending poverty and hunger throughout the country. And in fact, what I have seen, the success story, uh, that really should be modeled in many places around the world is that China has reduced the number of people that are in extreme poverty. That is a remarkable story. Another key message of the paper, China's continuously strengthened the rule of law. The paper says efforts have been made to ensure impartial exercise of judicial and procuratorial powers, fair trial for all parties, and protecting the rights of criminal suspects, defendants, and prisoners. The paper says the quality of public legal services is being improved, public awareness of protection of human rights is enhanced, and corruption is being fought to safeguard people's interests. Monday in Vancouver, Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou is back in court here at Vancouver Law Courts as her defense lawyers lay out some of the reasons why they believe she should not be extradited to the U.S. Uh, Ms. Meng, of course, has been charged by the U.S. for, among other things, in her capacity as a Huawei official, violating U.S. trade sanctions against Iran, also uh, accused of laundering money through U.S. banks. Uh, obviously, she's contesting those allegations, and she's uh, contesting uh, the attempt to extradite her back uh, to the United States. Uh, that's what these hearings are all about uh, here at the courts. Lawyers are arguing there was an abuse of process, that when she came into Vancouver, landed at the airport uh, last December 1st, uh, that it basically took three hours uh, for authorities there to actually arrest her, that she was first detained when she came off the plane from Hong Kong. Uh, then they asked her a bunch of different questions, uh, interrogated her, went into her computer, uh, checked the insides of that computer to some great detail without ever letting on that they planned to arrest her the way uh, the defense argues various authorities both on Canada's side and on the U.S. side had been planning all along. They say that in effect uh, was a violation of her charter rights, her civil rights, and they say that's one major reason why she should not be extradited to the U.S. We're in the midst and actually beginning of two weeks of hearings, eight total days, where uh, both sides will be sort of laying the groundwork for what could be an eventual extradition hearing, which is scheduled to take place in three different parts in 2020, beginning this coming January. So a judge here is uh, considering the various uh, defense arguments, trying to turn over evidence to the defense uh, from the Canadian authorities. The defense is looking for a host of different texts, emails, correspondence uh, to underline and undergird their overall point that there was a tremendous amount of coordination between the two sides and again that that time lag the three-hour uh, time lag at Vancouver Airport was entirely uncalled for and in fact illegal. The S&P Dow Jones indices include 1,099 A shares in its global benchmarks with a 25 percent inclusion factor. The A shares of 147 large cap stocks, 251 mid caps, and 701 small caps come mainly from five sectors, including banking, finance, food and beverages, medicine, and electronics. At a partial inclusion factor of 25%, China's A shares are projected to represent a weight of 6.2% in the S&P Emerging BMI. Also on Monday, FTSE Russell was to raise the weighting of A shares in its global benchmarks from 5 to 15 percent and include 87 new A shares constituents. The move marks the second stage of incorporating Chinese shares into its indexes. 
Fuzi Russell first added Chinese shares to its indexes in June. 1,097 Chinese stocks, or 20 percent of Chinese A shares, were bought into the indexes, and another 40 percent was expected to be added next March. A share inclusion steps of the two major investment index compliers are expected to generate 5.1 billion U.S. dollars worth of inflow into A shares. Analysts say that foreign capital might continue to flow into the A share market as the widely tracked global indexes start incorporating more Chinese shares. Every morning at 7 o'clock, Luis Valentin anchors a live radio show aimed at thousands of immigrants across the United States. Named after day laborers in Spanish, Radio Jornalera has become a voice for immigrant workers in the country. The 46-year-old single father from Mexico has previously worked in menial jobs for nearly three decades. He says he struggled with discrimination and abuse by employers. We watch a lot of families flee from, from uh, to different states back to Mexico. We saw a lot of uh, pain, you know, suffering, you know, watching all these families being breaking apart, uh, kids end, ending up being alone. I, I, was, uh, I had to take care of two, two, two teenagers at a time. Ordinary workers participate in the show to share their own experiences. The way this radio is most useful to the listeners is all the advice that experienced workers like myself can provide so that they don't make the same mistakes. In some cases, it might be an issue of a language barrier. And in some cases, the employers do not comply with what they say when they're hiring. They make an offer, but later they say they can't pay that much. In a storage room turned studio, the radio station has already become a major resource for immigrants in a few months. Organizers are now airing the show on a mobile application and on social media to reach a wider audience. We connect also the show uh, through Facebook Live and YouTube Live. So in that way we, uh, we reach more people, we connect with the community, because usually the people who listen to us uh, or they are working or they are waiting to go to work. So in that way, they can spend uh, that time learning. The impact that we are having uh, is tremendous. We reach 200,000 people in one transmission. Radio Jornalero was founded by the National Day Laborer Organizing Network, which runs this community job center. For years, this has been a meeting place for hundreds of day laborers and employers alike. But aside from finding daily jobs, workers also come here to hone their skills and learn about their rights. In fact, it was the anti-immigrant rhetoric of President Trump that triggered the plan to launch this radio station. So the idea of the radio came when, with, when actually, actually Trump ascended to power, that we needed our own uh, means of communications. We needed to create our own content because CNN, MSNBC, Fox, will never come and provide coverage and do justice to what immigrants think. So we have to generate our own content. Thousands of immigrants vowing to continue fighting for their rights. In a note building in Damascus, Syria, a 44-year-old Sandy Haraj is performing the traditional Syrian shadow play Caracols and Awaz. The shadow play offers humorous social criticism through satirical narratives involving the characters of Karakos and his friend Awaz. For hundreds of years, plays such as this one have brought joy and happiness to the people of Syria. However, compared with the play's two main subjects, Sandy's life is far less relaxed and happy. I had to flee home at that time and lost more than 1,600 props on the way, as well as large quantities of leather used to make puppets. When Sandy was in Lebanon, he made a living by driving a taxi, but he never gave up on the art, performing regularly for Syrian children in local refugee camps. In 2018, Shadow Play was inscribed on the list of UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage in need of urgent safeguarding. 
The news ignited more enthusiasm for Sandy to continue his art. When I heard the news, I felt a little hope rising in my heart. I am very happy to hear this endangered art recognized by the international community and will be protected in the future. I will also have a broader stage. Now Sandy has returned to his homeland. In addition to performing shadow play, he has a new identity, shadow play teacher. Sandy and more than a dozen of his students are trying to incorporate the stories of ordinary Syrians during the war into their performances in order to arouse people's hopes for peace.